Well, we flip the reading of Scripture passages today, as you noticed. Uh, today's sermon is, is based on Psalm 46. Let us hear now the Word of God, Psalm 46. <coughs> Excuse me. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. So the, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations God has brought on the earth. He makes wars to see, wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This is the word of the Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Well, I thought about entitling today's sermon, Jerusalem's River, but if I had those of you who are not particularly inclined toward metaphorical language would have said, well, but Jerusalem has no river, Don. And I know you're out there because there's literalists out there all over the place and you make sure I know things like that. And, and I do know that. I do know Jerusalem has no river, but this is metaphorical speech. In fact, Jerusalem uh, is one of the few ancient capitals that was not beside a river, which sort of, in my opinion, makes it go up in your book a little bit. Um, you think about all the other ancient cities, Babylon, on the Euphrates River. Egypt had three capitals, Memphis, Thebes, Alexandria, but all situated along the wide Nile. Rome boasted of its Tiber, London its Thames, but Jerusalem has no river, no tangible, literal river. Indeed, the psalmist is speaking metaphorically and as metaphors go when he says, there is a river which makes glad the city of God. The city of God is Jerusalem. When he says this, he realizes, I believe, that it is no lightweight figure of speech. Because I think what the psalmist is doing in Psalm 46 is bearing witness to the gospel truth to the faith truth that there is a river visible only through the eyes of faith, a great underground river that no one can dam up and no one can stop. And like all rivers, says philosopher Howard Thurman, it may twist and turn and fall back on itself and start again and stumble over an infinite series of hindering rocks, but at last the river must answer the call to the sea. There is a river that flows in and through the life of God's people. I've heard it said that an atheist is someone who has no invisible means of support. <laughs> but the faithful, the disciple of Jesus Christ, you and I, do have this invisible means of support at all times, flowing in and around and through us like a river, like a river. The powerful presence of God, the sustaining, life-giving, protecting presence of God. And I think there are times in our lives when you and I just need to be reminded of this truth. Maybe this morning you are a parent worried about the direction of, of your child's life, what it seems to be going, where it, what seems to be happening, the direction it's taking. You seek help. You sit down with your child. You have a talk. 
you put together new rules, new guidelines, still you just feel like you're losing ground. You just never imagined that parenthood would be this hard, this demanding, this challenging, and that try as you might, you just so much of the time feel utterly powerless, which you are. It's difficult being a parent. The word of the Lord for you today is there is a river. You have a river. Or maybe it is our nation and the way it seems continually to be coming apart. Political divisions and social unrest and fear of where we are as a country, where we as a country are heading. Regardless of your politics, maybe this is a matter of daily concern for you. I know it is for a lot of us. We should remember at such times, not what we hear on television, nonstop, but the gospel truth that you and I have a river which makes glad the city of God, the dwelling of God, God with us. Maybe you have just received troubling lab results and it's in indicating a, a really scary diagnosis and suddenly your world has just come apart and the bottom has dropped out. Or maybe you just look, look at yourself in the mirror and rue the passing of the years. Where have they all gone? You think of missed opportunities and chances passed up. You wish there was some way you could go back and rectify some things, do things differently. Who doesn't? But you can't do that. And so you go back into the reality of yet another day in your life, of the same old grind also known as your life, time still passing you by. Can anything new still happen for you, for your loved ones? God's word for you today is yes. Something new can happen for you because there is this river flowing in and through and among you. The presence of God. The psalmist is very clear. The river is the dwelling place of God among mortals. Now, in the psalmist's day, the dwelling, that dwelling place was always shifting and moving from place to place, from tabernacle to shrine to temple, kind of like a river does when it changes course. But in these days, in these days of the new covenant, the dwelling of God, the deep, unseen, eternal, life-giving river of life is situated not in a place but in a person, God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, who says to you, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and I will give you living water. There is a river which flows from the heart of God for you and for me. Some years ago, I was at church working on a sermon. It was Monday morning, and as I'm wont to do, I slipped into an empty Sunday school room to begin the process of putting together a sermon. Now, there are a few things that are more enjoyable in ministry, if you really do like to preach, than starting out on a sermon. It's a wonderfully creative process, and many times, most of the time, you, you begin with the text itself, and you read it, and you study it, and you ponder this word of God and then some ideas come to your mind and you think about what's going on in the community and you get excited about the conjunction of the two and you begin to put pen to paper and thoughts and illustrations come forth. It's, it's a great experience and feeling. It's something that we preachers get to do. We don't have to do this. We are privileged to do this and you also know that you don't have to have it written for another six days. You have all this time in front of you, so there's no real pressure or anxiety or deadline hanging over you on a Monday morning, which is when this was. And so my secretary knew where I was, and I went down and began to look at the text. I settled down to some coveted quiet time. Um, this is just one of those perfect days, a great start to the week. 
The morning light was just right. The coffee was just right. Everything was perfect. Now, when something like that happens, look out because something bad is about to happen. <laughs> sure enough, about 10 minutes later, there was a tap on the door. Don, you better come to the office. There's this woman who walked in off the street. She says she needs to see a minister, and I don't think she's going to leave until she sees one. And my beloved associate was not at work that day. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> now, you need to know that in that moment, I was no knight in shining armor. I will confess to you that it was hard, mighty hard, to leave that blissful setting and to go back over to the office. Frankly, I resented the intrusion. And I grumbled about never having enough time for me never having enough time to read, to think, to pray, to study. And this unknown woman from out of town who needs to see a minister sitting in the office who won't leave until she sees a minister, so I had to go. But I had hardly sat down when she got straight to the point. It seems that years ago she actually belonged to this church. I didn't know her then. It was when she was a child, and she belonged to this church and had grown up in this church, she told me. But now her life was a mess, a disaster. She probably was late 50s, early 60s, two failed marriages behind her. Nothing had really worked out for her on the job front. She admitted to a problem with alcohol and that she, had been un that she had been unable to overcome. And she had come into the city for a few days to visit family and everything had just come crashing down on her and she was riding down St. Charles Avenue and she didn't know what to do and she passed by this church and thought to herself, the only thing I can think to do is to go inside because I know that I will be safe there. Now she told me this, and I thought, wow, that's great. Imagine people saying that about not just this church, but the church. I loved hearing that. The church, the imperfect and too often hypocritical church, maligned, belittled by the world for being out of touch, assailed for theological ambiguity, doing the best it can sometimes just to stay afloat. We take a look at the church and all of its challenges, and sometimes we wonder if it's really worth it. Those of us who love the church really sometimes do. We get down. You get down. We worry about its future. But then something like this happens. Just imagine the feeling that I had, somebody coming off the street, coming in and saying that the only place that I could think to come was the church, because here I feel safe. So I sat there with her for just a few moments longer in silence. She really pretty emotional in tears. I'm in total amazement how in just a few short minutes I had gone from professional preoccupation to pastor. And I really didn't know what to say, what else to say. But then something hit me. I said, you have come to the right place because you are safe here. And that's what she needed to hear. And she thanked me and she left. You are safe here. We are safe here in the dwelling place of God. We all have this river, the psalmist reassures us, to which we can, in fact, must return again and again and again for the living of these days. God is our refuge and strength. That's where we get it from. Even though the mountains shake, even though one's very life is shaken to its foundations, there still is this river 
this God's life-saving, life-giving presence of God that we always have. Many a cherished uh, childhood memory took place actually on a river, the Ashapoo River in the low country of South Carolina where I grew up. I've told these stories to you many times through the years. This is a different one. One morning at dawn, my father and I were fishing with our friend and companion, Saul Smith, on this river. It was still and very quiet that morning, and as I was our practice, we were slowly paddling along the bank of the river, lazily casting artificial flies against floating clumps of pigweed and next to old tree branches. Every once in a while, a nice brim, a red breast, would pop the fly and suck the fly down and underneath and take it down, and if we were paying attention and had a tight line, we'd bring him in. This particular morning, though, our reverie was broken by the distant barking of dogs coming from nearby fallow rice fields. I was puzzled, but Saul knew exactly what was taking place. They're after a deer, he said. They're right behind him, and he's trying to make it to the river. Sure enough, dogs from neighboring farms had tracked a deer and were now in hot pursuit, closing in on the terrified beast. Dogs are faster than a deer and over, eventually would overtake the animal. The deer's only hope was the river to get there in time because instinctively the deer knew that dogs would not follow him into the river, into its swift currents, let alone the fact that dogs instinctively knew that the river was full of alligators and an alligator would not fool with a deer. But a dog was a different story. They'd tear a dog apart. The barking grew louder and was getting closer to us. Suddenly, this huge animal broke through the bushes 10 feet downstream from our boat, leapt into the water. A split second later, three coon dogs stopped short at the bank, savagely barking as the deer furiously paddled across the river to safety. For a moment or two, we just sat there in stunned silence. We were soaking wet. Then Saul chuckled and said, he's safe now. He's in the river. Ain't nothing going to bother him in the river. He's safe now. He's in the river. Yes. That's what we're talking about this morning. That's what the prophet Isaiah is talking about who foretells the coming of the Lord, that anyone who is thirsty for God need only come to the waters. That's what Jesus, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, was about. He was the true water of life who says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. I will not only give you shelter, but I will give you life. It seems to me that maybe this is the main reason we come to worship. Not for the liturgy, but to be reassured, to be remet, comforted, strengthened, encouraged, simply by being in the presence of the Lord, the dwelling place of God. It strengthens us for what lies ahead. It reassures us and comforts us because when we leave this place, we're going to go back out into a world following Christ into that world, and it won't be very easy for us, or at least it shouldn't be easy if we're doing our job. When we reach out to others the way Christ did, we will find ourselves in conflict with the world that says, no, you're not supposed to feed the hungry. You're not supposed to help the needy. You're not supposed to visit the prisoner. They need to take care of themselves. All you have to do is take care of yourself. No, you're not supposed to preach peace. You're not supposed to stand up to evil. You're not supposed to go along. You're just supposed to go along with the way things are and keep your mouth shut. It's not easy following Christ, is it? We get hungry. We get thirsty. We lose our nerve. We want to quit. But then this text comes along and reminds us that there is a river which makes glad the city of God, the dwelling place of the Most High. That's our river. 
It is the source of our power flowing in and through and among us. God himself comforting us, assuring us, strengthening us, and ultimately carrying us home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.